Good morning. On behalf of the Northwestern University Staff Advisory Council and the Office of the President, I would like to welcome you to the President's annual State of the University Address. My name is Deborah Cundiff, and I am currently the chair of the NU Staff Advisory Council, also known as NUSAC. NUSAC is very proud to sponsor this annual event. Once a year, NUSAC and the Office of the President come together to organize the State of the U University Address. This event is important not only because the President shares remarks with the community, but be also because the university community has an opportunity to engage in dialogue with the President. In addition to those joining us here in the Baldwin Auditorium on the Chicago campus, this event is also being webcast to the forum in the McCormick Tribune Center on the Evanston campus. Also, for commun community members who are unable to attend at one of the designated campus venues, this may, they may view this event by webcast from their computers. As you may know, an event of this scope requires the work and collaboration of several university staff members and departments. And I would like to take a few moments to recognize key members of the Northwestern community whose hard work has contributed to the ongoing success of the State of the University Address. From Academic Technologies, Michael Curtis, Harlan Wallach, Chris Ostertag, Caleb Lawson, Stephen Poon, Zoran Illich, Javier Huerta, and Larry M. Amwat. And from the Department of University Relations, Al Cubbage, Chris Garcia, and Lee Robertson. I'd like to thank President Beenan and the university administrators who are in attendance this morning. And I would like to give special thanks to all members of NUSAC, particularly our Vice Chair Sue Fox and Roseanne Mark and Lynn Steiner, who helped coordinate this event. The President will begin in a few moments. Following the President's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. There are several ways in which community, community members may participate. At Baldwin, we would like attendees to use one of the microphones on the two sides of the room. At either venue, attendees can use note cards that have been provided to write down your question and then give it to one of our new SAC members who will be circulating around the room um, and they will bring the question down front. And for those of you who are watching on webcast, you can send questions to the NUSAC email address during the event, which is NUSAC, N-U-S-A-C, at northwestern.edu. Now I'm pleased to introduce Northwestern's 15th president, Henry S. Beenan. President Beenan has just begun his 14th year in office, making him the fourth longest running president in Northwestern's history. During that time, North the university has made tremendous progress under his direction. Thanks to his dedicated leadership, Northwestern is one of the premier academic institutions in the country. It is in excellent shape financially, and it is home to truly outstanding faculty, staff, and students. Prior to coming to Northwestern, President Beenan was the dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and James S. McDonnell Distinguished University Professor at Princeton University, where he was professor for 30 years. President Beenan is one of the first three university presidents awarded the Carnegie Corporation Academic Leadership Award for Innovative Leadership in Higher Education. He is on the board of directors of several organizations, including the Council on Foreign Relations and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. President Beenan is a renowned scholar of political science and international affairs, an extremely knowledgeable fan of Northwestern's athletic teams and the person who has led this university to the position of prominence that it has today. Please join me in welcoming Northwestern's 15th president, Henry Beenan. Thank you. thank you, Deborah, for that kind introduction, and thank you all for being with us this morning. I'd also like to give my own thanks to the Northwestern University Staff Advisory Council for its continued sponsorship of this speech and uh, also thank the Feinberg School of Medicine for hosting us this year in the Baldwin Auditorium. As has been done for several years now, this event is being webcast and in addition, uh, NUSAC created an email box for people to send in questions. Several people have said they enjoy the question and answer period more than the formal remarks, I can surely understand that. And uh, I'll try to keep my speech relatively brief so we have plenty of time for questions. I do have uh, quite a good bit of good news to report and uh, I want to do so. This has been a year of remarkable success 
which really is a tribute to the hard work and dedication of our faculty, staff, and the outstanding achievement of our students. As president of this great institution, I represent Northwestern in many different settings. I'm always aware that it's the good work of many people that makes me proud to do so. As we have several new key administrative leaders this year, I'd like to recognize a number of them. First, Provost Dan Linzer, who took on the significant responsibilities of that position last fall and has been doing an outstanding job since then. As many of you know, Dan took over when Larry Dumas stepped down because of a medical condition, and Dan has kept our academics moving forward without missing a beat. I appreciate very much his rising uh, to the occasion, as he has. I'd say the same about Jay Walsh. I'm not sure I, sh sure I saw Jay here. Is Jay here? Um, who has been vice president of research since November, overseeing Northwestern's ever-growing research enterprise, which is a challenging task indeed. We're very fortunate to have someone with Jay's academic and administrative background here at Northwestern. He's rapidly become uh, a very valued member of our leadership team. I'd also like to thank Alden Morris for his work as interim dean of the Weinberg School, moving into that position when Dean Linzer became provost. Alden's steady hand has kept WCAS on track as we conduct a search for a new dean, and I very much appreciate his good work. And since this is her first State of the University address, I'd also like to welcome Pam Beamer, our new Associate Vice President for Human Resources, who started last fall. We're very glad to have Pam on board. And Pam, an important part of your duties is answering any and all HR-related questions that come up later. So I'll be turning to you as I turn to your predecessor, Guy Miller, for many a, a year. I'm hesitant. Uh, to talk first about finances, but I'll do so because they really are foundational to our efforts to pursue the highest order of excellence in teaching, research, and service. In higher education, the reality is that an institution's academic success is generally related to its financial strength. In order to provide outstanding academic programs, attract and retain top faculty and staff, and offer financial aid to needy students and have first-rate facilities we must have strong financial resources. Fortunately, we do. Northwestern's endowment has grown significantly in the past year and now totals approximately $7 billion. I loathe to ask our head of investments what's happened in the last three weeks, but nothing good, I assure you, but nothing disastrous either. In any case, this uh, growth of our endowment is a result of sound financial management, generous gifts from donors and good investment strategies, including the sale of a portion of our royalties from the drug Lyrica. The result is that Northwestern is indeed in excellent financial health. As some of you may be aware, there have been questions raised recently in Congress about whether universities are, quote, hoarding their endowments rather than using them to help students afford college. We're fortunate that our endowment has been doing well over the last years up approximately 14% for calendar year 2007. On the other hand, it is down uh, probably a couple of percentage points uh, for the last months. And um, there's nothing much good about bad markets from the point of view of the university, of course, but at least people, I, I hope, understand in Congress that uh, it's not a one-way street. Markets don't go only up. Some of you may have seen me quoted in the New York Times as uh, objecting very strenuously to the Grassley-Baucus uh, proposed legislation, which I think is going to be backburnered for a while, uh, mandating that universities spend at least 5 percent of our endowment. We're not foundations. We can't turn the spigot off and on like a foundation can if it has poor market performance. The things we do, we do on a continuing basis. That is, the costs that we incur are recurrent costs. So uh, a mandated 5 percent really makes very little sense, and I have objected very strenuously to it in Washington most recently when I've been down there about 10 days ago. And I'll continue to object strenuously to it, as will the AAU. So. Uh, Coming to the substance, uh, however, I can assure you that Northwestern is using a great deal of its endowment earnings to provide financial assistance for both undergraduate and graduate students. And we plan to do even more starting next fall. As announced earlier this month, 
will provide grants instead of loans to our neediest undergraduate students, thereby eliminating all loans for those students, and will cap the amount of federally subsidized loans for any undergraduate student at $20,000 over four years, thereby benefiting more than 1,000 students who otherwise would face a larger debt burden after graduating. So I think we've uh, taken a significant share of our increased endowment and uh, applied it to helping uh, families in need for our undergraduate students that matriculate here. Also starting next fall, we'll increase significantly the amount of financial support that we'll provide to graduate students, including increased stipends in those fields where we may have been somewhat below that of our peers, especially in science and engineering. We'll also provide improved financial packages for graduate students in the humanities and social sciences, additional funds to support independent innovative research, and additional travel funds for graduate students and will dedicate significant funding to guarantee 100% health coverage for our PhD students. I'm particularly proud of the increasing levels of success we're seeing in our PhD programs in many fields, and I think it's, it's tied to our ability to recruit very strong students as a result of our increased financial support. Graduate education is to some uh, large extent the way universities evaluate one another. Northwestern has always been known for its outstanding undergraduate education and its strong professional schools. I believe we're now gaining increased recognition for our graduate programs, and our PhD graduates are being offered positions at top universities more than ever before. I'm looking forward to the new rankings of graduate programs by the National Research Council, if they ever come out. Uh, and they're going to be the first rankings in 12 years and they are scheduled to come out later this year. I'm confident that Northwestern will move up in those rankings in several important fields. I'm also excited about uh, some of our new academic initiatives that will begin next fall. In particular, the founding of Northwestern University in Qatar. I've just recently come back from uh, Qatar uh, and in the party that went, including the chairman of the board and my wife, Lee, and John Margolis, who will be our Uber Dean out there, Rex Chisholm, uh, came along with us. And we had um, uh, interesting, I think, and, and potentially exciting conversations uh, with the Cutter Foundation about the medical school coming uh, to Cutter to uh, do research. And I hope that would also mean expanded opportunities for research funding here. Uh, in Chicago. It remains to be seen how we will work this out. I'm hoping Rex will go back and that Dean Jameson will uh, go back with him uh, because I think um, these, these could be very significant opportunities for the university in terms of working with new data banks, facilities abroad, and an increased financial flow for our own efforts. I, I somehow don't think and I doubt Rex thinks this will be a simple proposition. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's potentially a very rewarding one and one very much worth exploring. So I was very, very pleased that Dr. Chisholm could be with us. Um, we will start in September uh, to offer undergraduate degree programs in journalism and in communication in Education City. Uh, Education City is a kind of suburb of Doha, if you could call it that. Uh, it's a vast undertaking. It's, my guess, is the largest educational complex in higher education being constructed anywhere in the world. The buildings are astoundingly um, terrific, architecturally speaking. Um, there is, by the way, there is space already built for medical research uh, in the Cornell facility. It's just about to be unshelled. Um, how and what? and whether that would be shared in one way or the other is one of the things we'll have to explore. But it's a terrific looking place. Uh, when we were there, it was actually very cool, uh, actually un unseasonably cool. Uh, but I think above all, it's an exciting opportunity for us to collaborate with five other American universities that have established branch campuses there, I think in what can be an Im important new chapter in the history of Northwestern. So uh, I think it's um, really a remarkable opportunity for us to take our, um, our good faculty and staff and uh, go abroad. And uh, I think we can play a very important uh, role 
in the continued development of higher education in a part of the world which is needless uh, to say um, uncertain, troubled in some respects. And uh, this, this campus will be a regional campus, not just a campus for Qatari citizens, but I think it will be a magnet campus for people coming from all over the region as well as South Asia. And I think it's a real opportunity for Northwestern to expand its brand and its reputation. Many people uh, throughout the university have been working really hard at making this a success. When it launches next fall, I've already uh, alluded to uh, Associate Provost Margolis. Uh, our budget director, Jim Hurley, has played a terrifically constructive role in these conversations, as has our general counsel, Tom Klein. Uh, going abroad and setting something up new is, is a really complicated endeavor, perhaps more complicated than we envisioned when we started this whole thing, Tom. In any case, I appreciate the real dedication uh, to this exciting endeavor of many, many people. So for a brief review, uh, continue on, try to do it a little more quickly and maybe not move away from my tech so much. Uh, at the law school during the past year, the school established a working group to update its strategic plan and to uncover the skills and competencies that its graduates will need in order to maximize their career success. The law school gathered input from faculty, students, alumni, and practitioners, including uh, leading law firm senior managing partners, as well as corporate general counsels and leaders in, uh, and general counsels of major government and nonprofit organizations. The law school is now considering proposals to refine its programs in response to this process. Additionally, the school has had a banner year in its placement of graduates into federal judicial clerkships. The Feinberg School this year saw the introduction of NU Invention, a groundbreaking new course on medical innovation involving mixed teams of students from Feinberg, Kellogg, McCormick, and Law. The goal of this course is to teach students about the process of medical device development from ideation to the marketplace by providing them with a compressed but highly hands-on version of the real world process. And of course, we're excited by two important developments by our hospital partners. The opening of the new Prentice Women's Hospital uh, at Northwestern Memorial Hospital and the planned construction of the new Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital on our Streeterville campus. The new Prentice opened last fall. It's a terrific state-of-the-art facility, and the new Children's will be a significant addition to our campus, enabling a much more uh, closer collaboration on clinical care, as well as uh, eventually uh, in research. In regard to admissions, there's no question that a Northwestern education is in great demand. For the first third straight year, we received a record number of freshman applications for fall admission. At the end of January, we had approximately 25,000 applications, a 14% increase from one year ago. Over the last three year, freshman applications have increased by 54%, a performance match by almost no other peer institution. And I thank admissions for their excellent work again this year. The Kellogg School of Management also continues to see a steady rise in its applications, which are up more than 20% from last year. Additionally, in order to highlight faculty research, Kellogg recently launched Kellogg Insight, a web-based research digest. It was developed in response to students and alumni requests for a digest that reflects an up-to-day account of what the uh, Kellogg faculty is producing. Finally, Business Week again ranked the Kellogg Executive MBA program number one in the nation. Both Business Week and US News and World Report have bestowed this top honor upon Kellogg since their surveys debuted in 1991 and 1990, respectively. Additionally, in its recent global ranking, the Financial Times listed all four of the Kellogg School's global MBA programs in the top 20. At the law school, applications for admission also are bucking national trends, with the law school experience experiencing a slight increase uh, compared to a 2% decline nationally. At the Feinberg School of Medicine, last fall's entering class had strong academic qualifications with an average undergraduate science GPA of 3.68 and combi combined mean MCAT scores of 34.2. These credentials continue to exceed national averages, and significantly 82% of the class engaged in research on the undergraduate or graduate level prior to entering Feinberg. 
In all of our admissions work and in the recruitment of our faculty and staff, we remain committed to attracting a diverse group of students and faculty. Our new no loan and loan cap initiatives that I mentioned earlier should aid us in increasing the number of low and moderate income students who come to Northwestern, and we continue to seek to broaden our hiring pool for faculty and staff. In other academic news, the School of Continuing Studies plans to celebrate its 75th anniversary this year by inviting SCS alumni students and faculty to visit its newly renovated state-of-the-art classroom and community space in Weebolt Hall. SCS also expanded its physical presence with new locations uh, in the Loop and Evanston and on the Evanston campus. Working with Feinberg, SCS developed graduate programs in healthcare. SCS also worked with the provost's office to seek extension of the university's accreditation from the Higher Learning Commission of North Central Association to allow SCS to offer graduate programs online. As always, uh, those of you who live and work, which is all of you on our different campuses, understands that construction continues uh, apace. Here on the Chicago campus, in addition to the work in Weebolt, we're nearing completion of the build out of the 10th floor of the Lurie uh, Medical Center with plans for occupancy this spring. And again, we have plans to increase the space of the Lur Robert H. Lurie Medical Research Center by building a new tower uh, on, its, uh, uh, on its space. In the law school, renovation continues in the McCormick Building to create new seminar rooms and refurbish offices. On the Evanston campus, we announced uh, just earlier this week, a really exciting uh, moment, that the university will build a new building for the School of Music on the south end of the lakefront. I'm really uh, truly enthusiastic and excited about this. It's been a long time coming. Um, and as we plan uh, for this, we really want to make it a signature uh, building. It's on a very beautiful part of the campus facing the lake, and we plan a design competition to choose the architect for it. We hope to be able to announce a significant gift for the building, a naming gift in the near future, and we're still actively raising funds for any of you music lovers. You can see me afterwards. <clears throat> we're also uh, beginning our planning for a major new addition to the uh, Technological Institute for a new analytic services lab and to provide additional space for the McCormick School. Several other major projects are underway in Evanston that I've mentioned previously, including the construction of Silverman Hall, the renovation of Annie Mae Swift, the addition to Crow Hall, and construction of the new soccer and lacrosse fields on the North Lakefront. Another key project is the expansion of the central utility plan to accommodate the increased heating and cooling demands that result from uh, all this new construction. As we build new space, we need to service it, of course. All this construction is expensive and certainly uh, on occasion a bit of an inconvenience for those of us, of us on the campuses, and I realize that. But the new facilities will greatly benefit our teaching and research activities. I sometimes think when people complain to me about the inconvenience that they think building a building is like growing mushrooms in a dark closet to spring them up overnight somehow or other. As you know, it doesn't work that way. Um, most of you know, I think, that we conducted the first tests of a new university emergency notification system last month and used it for the first time just a couple of weeks ago for a weather emergency. Both times the system worked very well. In addition, next month we'll begin installing an outdoor loudspeaker system for use on the Evanston campus and looking at ways to improve cell phone reception uh, on campus. All of these measures are designed to improve our communica uh, communications capabilities in the event of an emergency. And of course, we've recently seen another tragedy uh, on a, a fellow uh, university in Illinois, the North, Northern uh, Illinois University. Our ha hearts go out to all those affected by those horrible and tragic events. And we prepare as well as we can, not just for um, very sad things that occurred there, but also for a more normal course of bad weather or other things that can occur on a campus. Often we can't do all that we would like to do, but we need to prepare as best we can in the event of emergencies, and we're undertaking to do that. Our information technology department 
has also undertaken several other major initiatives, notably establishing a new stu student email and calendaring services, increasing the available capacity by more than 50-fold, and several exciting new projects in the area of academic technology, including launching a Northwestern channel on YouTube this week. I'm not a big YouTube watcher, but I'm sure many of you are. <clears throat> in research, Northwestern's research volume exceeded $400 million, uh, actually got to $416 million for the first time in 2007, increasing by more than 8% from $384 million in 2006. My recollection is when I came here uh, some 14 years ago, we were doing about $150, $155 million a year in sponsored research. A lot of that increase has been driven by the medical school, I think well, well more than 50 percent of our sponsored research, closer to 55 or high 50s percent, is generated by the medical school. <clears throat> this new total award volume is the highest in university history and comes in a year in which federal funding was tightening. Um, I can tell you that uh, just coming back from Washington, I, I don't think it's going to be easy to increase federal funding for science, but my hope is uh, that we'll have some kind of supplemental that uh, will increase funding. Uh, I think that's perhaps more likely in NSF than it would be in NIH, but we're working hard to get the general funding up, both for NSF and NIH. Um, the budgets are very tough. Uh, I think to some extent there's been a kind of odd breakdown in the process of the funding for science and engineering funding, um, which I could go into in more detail but won't right now. Uh, but all of us need to just continue to work on this. Uh, it's critically important uh, for healthcare, for national defense, for the whole gamut of things that's entailed by uh, NIH and NSF funding and DOE for that matter too. As a member of the Board of Argonne, I'm very concerned about DOE funding for Fermi and Argonne, and uh, there's just a lot of work to be done. I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll see some increases, but beyond what's in the President's budget, but I wouldn't expect uh, very large increases. So I think actually we're doing pretty well in the context of flat funding, uh, and we just have to work as hard as we can, both on the presidential side to get the general volumes up and on the researcher's side by putting forward a lot of good proposals. There's just no other answer. That said, we once had, uh, once again, had very exciting developments, and I'll just mention a few highlights. Phil Messersmith, a professor of biomedical engineering, and his research team applied the tools of nanotechnology and polymer chemistry to better understand uh, adhesives used by, they're using, uh, looking at muscles and geckos, um, to develop new materials that capture the unique uh, properties of their natural counterparts, a really interesting project. The outcomes of this research include li uh, liquid surgical adhesives for tissue repair, temporary wet adhesives, and non-accumulating medical device coatings for prevention of bacterial infections. Our newest university research center, the Argonne Northwestern Solar Energy Research Center, or ANSWER, brings the combined expertise of researchers at, at the Argonne National Lab and Northwestern together to focus on solar energy. ANSWER, under the direction of uh, Mike Wazielewski, professor of chemistry, combines and expands the research interests of both institutions to take on the challenges of economically viable solar energy use. I, one of the things that I'm actually most gratified by has, by, has been our increased um, relationship with Argonne. I think we've, uh, we're making, we've just made two recent two uh, physics appointments joint with Argonne. We've made a number of chemistry appointments. I think it's very important uh, that we build on this relationship, and I know Jay Walsh will be instrumental, as his predecessor Brad Moore was, in uh, uh, really helping to forge a closer and more expanded relationship with Argonne. Um, when it comes down to the nitty gritty of how we should do it, I have to rely on the vice presidents for research who are now also on the board uh, of, of Argonne with me. I can do some heavy lifting at the general level, but it's not my field, and I need a lot of help when we come to the programmatic 
uh, matters of the um, relationships between the university and Argonne. I also uh, I've mentioned already uh, how important the Feinberg School has been in the research growth of the university. Feinberg saw a 17 percent increase in new grants last year. Significant awards include a renewal from the National Cancer Institute for the support of the Robert H. Lurie Cancer Center led by Steve Rosen. A national project directed by Wayne Anderson, professor of molecular pharmacology and biological chemistry, to map a gallery of 375 proteins from deadly infectious diseases over the next five years. Also an important study of health and disease in Hispanic Latino populations led by Martha uh, Daviglis, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, professor of preventive medicine a landmark national research, clinical, and education program that targets fertility threats posed uh, to women by cancer treatment led by Teresa Woodruff and Thomas uh, Watkins, professor of obstetrics and gynecology. Northwestern faculty continue to be recognized for their outstanding achievements. Among those who earned honors this year were Jan Achenbach and Tobin Marks, honored at the White House uh, uh, and receiving a National Medal of Science. Chairman of the board, Pat Ryan, and I went down for that occasion. It was just a wonderful occasion. Uh, Jan Achenbach also had earlier won the National Technology Medal, one of the few scientists in American history who's actually won the National Science uh, Medal and the National Technology Medal, and a really extraordinary achievement. Stuart Dybeck, the first distinguished writer in residence at Northwestern, was awarded a MacArthur Genius Award. And Jay Fraser Stoddard, Board of Trustees Professor of Chemistry, newly arrived at Northwestern, was selected by the World Cultural Council to receive the 2007 Albert Einstein World Award of Science. Bob Lamb, the John Evans Professor of BMBCB, was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Carol Lee, Professor of Education, was elected to the National Academy of Education. Charles Taylor, the Board of Trustee Professor of Law and Philosophy, received the Templeton Prize for discoveries about spirituality. Proves we've made good Board of Trustee professorship appointments, Dan. <clears throat> Mary Zimmerman, Performance Studies, directed a ghost story-inspired version of uh, the new production of Donizetti's Lucia de Lammermoor that opened the Metropolitan Opera seasons last September. I went to that opening. It was just a wonderful occasion with a lot of Chicagoans coming to New York for to see Mary's directing of Lucia. Our students also continue to earn top awards. Some highlights, uh, two students, Amber North, a senior at Weinberg, and Andrew Gruen, a Medill senior, were just recently awarded <coughs> Gates <coughs> Cambridge scholarships. Alexander Hertel Fernandez, who I'm going to be seeing this afternoon, a senior in political science, was one of the 10 students nationally chosen for the USA Today All-America First Team. Once again, our athletic programs enjoyed success. For the third straight year, Northwestern finished among the top 30 universities in the country in the Director's Cup standings, which measures overall, academic, uh, overall athletic success. We also do very well on the academic side. Our football team, I think, once again had the number one uh, graduation record for Division I football. Our women's lacrosse team uh, had a historic year by winning their third national NCAA title. And right now, lacrosse is ranked number one, women's tennis number two, and I hope softball is ranked number one after beating the number one in three teams out west. Uh, I haven't seen that, but it's my deduction. Uh, we also had uh, some of our swimmers, Matt Grievers, Mike Alexandrov, Kyle Bubals, Bruno Barbic. Uh, and uh, uh, all won individual national championships, as did Jake Herbert, one of our wrestlers. All told, 10 of our 19 varsity sports teams particip participated in NCAA championships. Among our staff, the 2007 Employee of the Year winners were Carrie Harper of the Feinberg School of Medicine and Laura uh, Garrity of the McCormick School of Engineering uh, and Applied Science on the Evanston campus. We also had 69 Service Excellent Award winners this year, including six who received at least two awards. Those six were Brenda Bryant of the Office for Research, Julia Dell, Elizabeth Haley, Peter uh, Livens, I 
hope I'm saying that right, uh, Jenny Pearson uh, and Joe uh, Feidenter of the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science. We applaud the many members uh, of our Northwestern University community who demonstrated outstanding service throughout the year. There have also been important initiatives that enhance the university community and advance our efforts to embrace diversity as part of our mission. For the second year, classes on both of our campuses were suspended for the Martin Luther King holiday. A combination of compelling plenary speakers and smaller programs devoted to service and dialogue provided opportunities for members of the Northwestern community to engage Dr. King's legacy for our time. Also for the second year, the university mounted the One Book, One Northwestern. This year focused on James Baldwin's classic, Go Tell It on the Mountain. I sent copies of the book to our entering undergraduate students, and the book served as a focus for the president's convocation in Wildcat Welcome Week. <clears throat> we had a very productive year in our development efforts, raising a total of $192 million in cash and an additional $220 million in new commitments. Uh, generous gifts from Patrick and Shirley Ryan and Ann Lurie have recently been made to support the Feinberg School of Medicine and its research partnership with Children's Memorial Hospital. Sam Zell has also been a very generous supporter of the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center at the Feinberg School. And the Crown family has recently made a very generous gift to support Middle Eastern studies in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences. And I'm very grateful to our development office led by Vice President Sarah Pearson uh, for their excellent work. Thank you, Sarah, and your colleagues. I'm also pleased to report that Kathy Jaharis, a generous alumna of the School of Communication, has committed funds to create the Jaharis Family Foundation Endowed Fund to support a faculty chair in the School of Communication. Also last year, we completed our athletics initiative, raising over $17 million for endowment and facility support, which was a couple of million dollars better than our goal. As I recall, it was a $15 million goal. In summary, during the past year, Northwestern continued our steadfast pursuit of excellence in teaching, research, and community engagement. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and the senior leadership of Northwestern, I'd like to extend our sincere appreciation for all of your many outstanding contributions to this great institution. Thank you very much. I'll now answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you, President Beenan. Um, now is obviously the time for the question and answer session. So um, hopefully the microphones will be working shortly. And we ask um, anyone who has a question to please step up to one of the microphones and make sure you speak clearly into the microphone so that people at the other venues can hear you as well. Um, if you prefer to write your question down on a note card, you can pass it to the end of the aisle and someone at the ends will pick up your questions and bring them up front. So um, I'd like to start by asking a question that was sent to NUSAC um, before the event. Has there ever been a process or consideration of having employees evaluate their supervisor's performance? And can you give us your thoughts? Um, I don't know whether we've had that process uh, of having um, folks evaluate their supervisors. Pam, are you aware of any such process? You can just say yes or no, and I can have, we've had that process. Uh, I, one of the, the troubles I, I would see, maybe we've had that process fine, is there are lots of folks, uh, and you'd have to have some systematic way of collating and understanding the process of evaluation uh, of supervisors, but Pam tells me we have that process. I have a very small staff, so they would have a very hard time having anonymity, uh, <laughs> unless we included all the vice presidents and deans. And uh, so I have a small number of direct reports, I guess, and people working in my office. Anyone brave enough can try it. <laughs> Okay, I've been told that the microphones are working. Just make sure that you talk really clearly into it. I think I wasn't talking loud enough before. So now I'd like to go ahead and invite someone else who'd be interested in coming up and asking a question to one of the microphones on the sides. Uh, I, is this, does this 
working? Not yet. Um, I wanted to ask kind of a follow-up question to the one that Deb just asked, um, which is I've heard from both managers and from others that um, new managers don't necessarily know who to go to for what. They don't necessarily have experience with supervising and that sort of thing. And I know that recently we had a new employee orientation that was created for employees that are new to the university. And what I wonder is, will the, would the administration consider something like a new manager orientation to give managers access to um, learning where they need to go for what and how to do things that they didn't necessarily need to do when they weren't supervising people? Um, who, who are you pointing to? Well, I, I'll give my own view about it. I, sure. I think, you know, we should, uh, we, we, I, I'll ask Senior VP Sunshine to come up or, 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 or Pam or somebody else. I mean, I know we've done it for chairs. We've had a process of trying to train chairs. I don't, I hope that when we hire supervisors and managers, they sort of know their job. But that doesn't mean if they're new that they can navigate all the ins and outs of the specifics of the university, and we ought to do our best to help them do that. Gene, do you want to say something about that? I mean, this is, a, this is an important area for us, and, and the, 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 um, the solution is training, training, and more training and more education. And Paul Corona, who many of you know, uh, has started a number of programs along these lines for different levels of incoming managers. So the president mentioned for new chairs, we have programs for new deans, we have programs for uh, other levels of supervision. Been very well attended, um, I'm proud to say well, well rated by those who are attending. But the issue is doing more of them uh, on, on this campus and in Evanston. We never seem to have enough of them, but that's a good sign in some respects because it indicates that they're they're, they're getting some penetration, so to speak, that people are interested in, in, in uh, doing them and in participating in them. We, we will be doing more. So I would say watch for the announcements about these. There's a chance to nominate people who work for you. There's a, a chance to nominate other colleagues and so forth. And as I say, they're pegged to different levels of supervisory experience and different levels of supervisory responsibility. So we know this is a big deal. People are not born to be supervisors, especially in an academic institution. We should probably have a cram course for new presidents. I, I reflecting back after now 14 years that when I first um, literally walked through the door and came to a room where you're looking at a bunch of vice presidents and deans, none of whom you really know except for one or two that you might know circumstantially from a different life uh, or people that were involved in the search process and thinking about as to you know who you thought you would rely on or not. Or for what kinds of things, and it's it's an interesting process if you're an outsider to a big, complicated institution rather than having grown up in it. Uh, so where you know a lot of people, it's it's. Uh, I've been reflecting on that a lot. I reflect on a lot of things these days. <clears throat> this is a question that was submitted to New Sac, um, and by the way. We do appreciate the increased financial assistance for students. Why are education benefits better for dependents of employees rather than the employees themselves, especially considering that the education of employees directly benefits the university? Well, this is a question that I think we, you know, I, I don't think I give a state of the university address without having this question raised as to the issue of educational benefits for staff. And I think, um, you know, you're, you're always sort of on the horns of a dilemma uh, with regard to one, um, and excuse me for not looking at you, but I'm told to look straight ahead. So uh, one, how, what, do you, what do you put into professional career development? And, and we, we do have some investments we make in that. You take people away from their jobs, or you training them up for somebody else's job. Uh, what, what can you afford? And I think it's always a balance when we're looking at benefits of trying to understand all those things. Um, you want people to do their jobs better. You want them to be able to move up the ladder or move laterally to other, perhaps more complex jobs. And at the same time, there, there are just constraints about how much you can do and how much you can take people away from their jobs and what you can afford. I and mean, that's my response to that question. I was given this question um, with the new performance review for the staff. It doesn't seem to be consistent. And are there more meaningful ways 
um, that this review process could be for long-term employees and make it world university-wide. I, I think on this question, I'm going to have to ask uh, the HR folks to to respond. Is this on now? It's on. Just speak loudly, Paul. Uh, the university has implemented a new performance evaluation process that actually starts with communicating performance expectations at the beginning of the year. It's called performance excellence, and about 60% of the university has signed on for this over the past four years. We would be thrilled if 100% of the university signs on. The processes are available, the help is available, but we haven't required it. It just hasn't been part of our culture to do so. Thank you. This uh, question was submitted in advance, and it reads, will any of the funds that are freed up because of Lyrica revenue be used to promote staff retention and development? Well, th the answer is yes, uh, insofar as anything that helps the finance of the finances of the university um, helps us on attracting students, retaining and attracting the best staff, and the best faculty. So while the Lyrica use is an earmarked use, that is to say, um, Lyrica, the funds that we, when we monetized part of our Lyrica uh, royalty stream, and the Lyrica royalty stream is only partially monetized. We're not going to say exactly what percent, but a significant percent of the Lyrica royalties remains is a flow that we get every quarter. And, um, but for that part we monetized, and to a large extent for the continuous flow, the areas of use have, are designated areas. And um, I've said before how we are using the funds, and I've been completely consistent in the actual use from what I said we would do, which I, by and large, try to keep my word and say things and then do them. Um, so uh, the biggest slug of Lyrica funds went into the budget for the vice president for research. And that was funds that allows us to attract and retain a wide uh, group of people, largely faculty, but in theory not exclusively so. If we need more uh, staff support, as we do, as we attract um, good scholars, and uh, we'll use those funds. Uh, another very large amount of Lyrica funds went into support uh, for graduate students, as I suggested earlier. And a significant uh, sum uh, goes to undergraduate financial aid. Another significant sum goes into an endowment for renewal and replacement of physical plant. Um, we are, this is an aging uh, physical plant, which particularly on the Evanston campus requires ever more renovation. And you have to pay for that somehow, and we've constructed a way of paying for it uh, by increasing endowment funds for renewal and replacement. We're building all these buildings, uh, both here and on the North Campus, and we've had to create a fund which would enable us over time to pay off the bonds for the buildings that we, uh, we build. I know some people think that bonding is manna from heaven, but uh, I can assure you that the folks who in the rating agencies don't think so. Uh, they believe, as do the bondholders, that somehow you have to pay your bonds off. And one, one of the things I don't want to do is leave the university with a huge indebtedness uh, that it will take decades to climb out from under. We're not going to do that. So as we've been building buildings, of course we try to raise as much money as possible for the buildings. But we never, in my experience, we have never built a building in my time, and we've either built or renovated, uh, seriously renovated more than 20 buildings, um, we've never uh, had full funding for any of the buildings, which meant that some significant share of the cost of the buildings and the renovation came out of the university's finances. And those finances um, uh, 
more than supplemented significant gifts. Obviously, we've done very well in raising gifts for the very building we're in, we're in right now and some other buildings. So we've had to figure out a way of financing that uh, while maintaining a very high debt rating and maintaining the credibility of our board of trustees that trusts us when we do prudent, prudential uh, budgeting of the university. Um, I think we've done all that, as I said at the very outside of my talk. So that the lyric of funds will certainly be used for, I, I think broadly speaking, strengthening personnel at Northwestern uh, and, and will be used, or they will release other funds to enable that to happen. So the, the answer in the broadest uh, uh, statement is yes. Though if you looked on a chart, on a PowerPoint, you'd see designated functional areas for the use of uh, Lyrica funds. Now, by the way, when we establish a new center, as we did in historical studies, or two new centers in, um, in the economics department, or uh, in, increased endowment funds available in the nanosciences, or uh, with gifts uh, from Mrs. Buffett, plus the funds that we added from Lyrica, expanded the Buffett Center for uh, International and Comparative Studies. Every one of those endeavors leads to an expansion of staff and usually requires upgrading the quality of the staff as the missions and the functions of these centers increase and get more complex. So in an indirect way, again, the financial uh, strength of the university and its ability to expand what it's trying to do both on the teaching and research side, has led to a demand for uh, more staff and has led to a demand for, I would say, always pushing the levels up of, uh, of the um, abilities that people have to manage complex centers. Now, I would still say, I think I inherited a university that was understaffed. And I think um, the trick has been over the last 13 or 14 years to figure out how we could better staff what we were doing. Um, and I don't think we fully figured it out, by the way. Uh, or I should say, I think we understand it, but maybe we haven't fully implemented all that we wanted to do for financial constraints. It's just a question of how fast we ramp up the costs of the university and their costs on a recurrent basis, uh, even if we backfill a particular job and Vice President, Senior Vice President Sunshine says, well, we'll do some of it on a recurrent basis and some of it on a one-off basis. For some years, you're, it's a recurrent cost in a way. You're just trying to figure out how best to do it over time. Um, so I think in the research area in particular, and I've said this before in State of the University addresses, probably we were too slow to ramp up staff as we expanded our research. And we did it because we wanted to put as much money as we could into um, hiring good faculty and new faculty and um, expanding programmatic things we were doing. And at some point, uh, a point we probably reached some time ago, you hurt what you're doing if you don't increase the human infrastructure as well as the IT and other administrative systems infrastructure, and we, we realize that. So we're trying to remedy this, and the question is how fast and how much money we do. Um, you know, I've, this is budget season, so I have requests um, from schools, from administrative units, for four or five times what we could meet uh, in terms of the demands on the university's purse, and it's up to the provost and myself and the other senior leadership of the budget, uh, budget group to figure out what the highest priorities are. We can't do everything. Simply, uh, most of the things we'll turn down are gonna be good things. They're not frivolous. I don't think anybody ever comes forward with frivolous requests to us, but we can't meet all of them. Lyric, what Lyrica enabled us to do was to put a firm financial basis under some things we needed to do anyway and to expand things we would not have been able to do without Lyrica. Without Lyrica, there's no way 
we could have gotten as competitive for graduate fellowships as we've got to in an incredibly compressed period of time. We probably could have struggled to find the money to do some things on the financial aid side for undergraduates, but they wouldn't have been as expansive, expansive and as quickly done as we've announced because of Lyrica. We're trying to also selectively do some new things, as I suggested when I said set up centers in economics, in the humanities, uh, in history. In the scheme of things, that's not large use of Lyrica. It's relatively small use compared to the big ticket items that I mentioned. But Lyrica, while important, it doesn't enable us to do every single thing we want to do in the university. It's just, it's big, but it's not, I don't want to say it's not that big because it is that big, but it's not, it can't allow us to do everything. It doesn't, it doesn't spare us uh, from needing to go out and raise a lot of money. Uh, and I hope nobody thinks that because of Lyrica, you know, we, we can't, we somehow don't have to work as hard as we can having um, a very strong development effort. We do. It doesn't spare us from prudential management and from working hard to have our investment performance go up. All these things are equally important in the university's success. We now have quintupled our endowment in my time, but we were way below peer institutions. We were the 15th biggest endowment of places in the university, and, and just in absolute numbers. And now we'll be anywhere from nine to seven, depending what, how the numbers shake out over the next year. That's great. But it doesn't also speak to the complexity of an institution. To say that you're the seventh, eighth, or ninth, or tenth biggest endowment in the country doesn't, you have to normalize for so many things. You need a complicated equation to know where you really stand. Who has professional schools? What's the, what's the size of the student body? Just a whole range of variables like this, which unless you get inside the absolute numbers by looking at those variables, it doesn't tell you how, you're, how you stack up compared to other universities. As you speak about the decision making of Northwestern, I wondered if you could speak further about Northwestern's responsibilities in Chicago and Evanston to act as an anchor for local community and economic revitalization in a ways that links Northwestern's academic missions with our business practices. So how can we assure that these decisions related to real estate or local purchasing, workforce development initiatives among others are made in purposeful ways that leverage and build benefits for our home communities? That, that's a very good question. I'll try not to di digress as much uh, in answering it as I did for the last one, but I, I try to sort of use these, some of these questions as what I think of as teaching moments. It's the pedagogue in me. You'll have to excuse me. So I think there are a number of ways we have community responsibilities. First, we need to be a good citizen in the communities in which we live. Uh, but I think of those communities as very broad communities. They're Evanston, they're Chicago, but they're the state of Illinois, the region, the country, the world. I mean, we are a great international institution. One of the reasons I wanted to go to Qatar was I think we can make a difference. I think in important fields of communication and journalism, we can do better in helping train people uh, who will be better journalists and communicators uh, in the Middle East and more broadly. I, I just, I have that conceit that we can help. Not that we can change the world, but that we can help, that we can make a difference. And I think that about all, all the communities in which we are in. So we want to be responsible members of those communities. We open our facilities to many events. We reach out to K through 12 by when we get NSF grants, many of them are grants that mandate that uh, what we're doing in materials, say research, we also have to take a teaching function. But if they didn't mandate it, I would think it's a good idea. It's what we want to do. We want to be able to make an impact uh, in, uh, both in our programs and directly. And in our programs, of course, we're hoping that the research that we create, the knowledge we create, the people that we uh, help form as individuals, as citizens of the world, will make an impact out there 
in society. So there are lots of ways that we uh, intervene in communities. Now, another way, and I think we have a very great responsibility here, when I go to the state of Illinois and to the federal government to ask for help uh, in uh, furthering along research, I always say that we take our responsibility for generating jobs very seriously. Some of the jobs that we generate come from building uh, buildings like the Lurie Research Medical Center and staffing it uh, with faculty and staff who are going to be in a new enterprise. So we're a driving force economically in that way. But we're also a driving force when we create new companies. We've had 54 spin-out companies that have come out of our uh, research enterprises in the last years. In the Searle, the old Searle Pfizer Skokie Center, there are five or six companies that came from, uh, that were started by Northwestern professors. There are some that will set up in uh, North uh, Brook. I hope they'll stay in the region. Uh, I hope they'll flourish in Chicago and on the North Shore. I don't control that process. The CEO may want to take uh, a company to Portland, as one did a few years ago that came out of the engineering school. But my overall answer to the question is it's important for us to be a good citizen and in all the facets of what the university does to make an impact in the communities in which we live. We do. And I think uh, we're always looking for ways to be helpful. Uh, as we do that. There are things we can't do, which people don't give us money to do. It's not in our purview to do. But there are many, many things that we do do. And I think it's, it's well recognized that we're just an important economic and social driver of the communities in which we live. I'd like to ask a question now from the forum room on the Evanston campus. I'm a Kellogg student. Last year, Kellogg tuition rose at three times the rate of inflation and now costs about $45,000 a year. 70% of Kellogg's budget comes from tuition, yet professors spend 5% of their time teaching. Meanwhile, NU's endowment keeps growing. Given these facts, I'm wondering how much longer students and families will be expected to heavily subsidize research efforts and why you opposed efforts by a state finance committee to start reducing tuition. Well, first, I don't think that the, some of the so-called factual premises are correct in that question. I doubt very much, uh, trying to remember what uh, Kellogg's tuition grew at last year, it wasn't three times the rate of inflation. Uh, and um, so that part's wrong. Kellogg faculty do not spend 95% of their time on research. That's a, that's a factually incorrect uh, stipulation. In fact, I would say that uh, Kellogg is a very strong teaching unit. Kellogg's reputation has historically rested on the fact that it has been such a strong teaching unit. And one of the things that shot Kellogg into the forefront many years ago of the top business schools in the country was the very strong positive response it got from uh, students who had both were sitting in Kellogg and had graduated from Kellogg, as well as from those folks who hired Kellogg students. I'm speaking here as a Kellogg faculty member, which I am. Uh, and uh, so I think that among the great um, business schools in the country, Kellogg has been especially appreciated for the strong input it makes in teaching the students it has. Now, Business schools have not historically provided um, a very large amount of uh, financial aid. And I think that's been true of law schools. And uh, I don't know what it would be, com comparatively speaking, at medical schools across the country. We're, we want to provide a larger amount of financial aid in our professional schools if we can raise the money to do so for a number of reasons. One, we want to enable people who have already piled up a lot of debt as undergraduates to be able to attend our very fine professional schools and uh, without incurring vast amount of more debt, though the folks who will graduate from those schools will on average have pretty high incomes as compared to, say, people who graduate from the music school on average or from the School of Journalism. These are just facts. These are, you can look at the data which tells you what your graduates uh, have in average income over a certain number of years after graduation. So it's not unfair to expect that there'll be higher debt 
uh, for coming out of a law school or business school or medical school. At the same time, I don't personally like constraining all the options. I want to have more money, say, available for financial aid in a law school so that those people who graduate from the law school who want a career that's a more community service oriented, what I would call public law career rather than uh, other fine careers, which are uh, estimable also, but a higher income generating, would at least have the prospect of doing that. So I would like to build up the, if we could, the funds for doing that. The same, by the same token, I would say that uh, for a business school. There are lots of people who will come out uh, that will get high paying jobs, but there are some who will come out that will want to do uh, social entrepreneurship and work in community service and use their skills to do that, and that's wonderful. And there'll be some folks who will come out of a great medical school like Feinberg uh, who also may want to take relatively lower paying jobs uh, at a point in their career, and whether they'll work in rural areas or in underserved areas or whatever. So we want to be able to provide the resources if we can to do that. But um, the final figure I want to give in answer to this question, it's a, it's a more general question, a more general answer to questions about financial aid and how we finance financial aid. If you look at universities, one of the things that I'm always wanting to look at on the financial aid side is how much of the financial aid budget comes from endowment and how much comes from your recurrent budget. At Northwestern, the overwhelmingly large share of financial aid revenues or costs that we incur come from our recurrent budget. They do not come from endowment. When I came here, again, if I remember the figures, we were funding from our, for our financial budget, financial aid budget, something like seven or eight percent of the total cost. And today it's closer to 17 percent, something like that. Maybe it's up to 20 percent. I doubt it with the latest amount of money that we put in from Lyrica. There are some universities, like the one I came from 14 years ago, that fully fund financial aid from endowment. It's not a hit on the on their recurrent budget, which means they've been accumulating funds for 200 years or whatever, building up their endowments for financial aid. It makes a big difference. I don't have the scope to uh, do everything I would like to do everywhere in the universities. And it's true, too, when you look at co uh, comparative endowments for law schools or medical schools or business schools. And you have to ask yourself how much of it's being funded out of endowment, which has been accrued through generous donors and how much of it's being funded out of the recurrent budget. And then the question is, what's the priorities on the recurrent budget? How do you want to spend your money? So I, I think it's an important question to ask. I don't think the premises were accurate, uh, and I've tried to answer it as honestly as I could. I have another question from the Evanston campus. What is your long-term vision of the outcomes of the One Northwestern initiative? I think. Um, the One Northwestern Initiative is very important. I think, and I want to answer this question in a couple of ways. One I've already alluded to when I talked about our relationship with Argonne. It's not quite a One Northwestern question, but um, when I came here, I thought there was a lot to be done in trying to integrate, particularly across the life sciences, what we were about. I think the relationships between the Evanston campus and the medical school left a lot to be desired. I actually convened a group. I remember uh, Pat Spear was part of that group, a number of other people, and I got together and I said, look, if I really want to invest heavily in the life sciences. I think it can be a great driving force for the university, for its reputation, for its mission, but we need to work in a more collaborative way. I would say under successive deans of the medical school and deans of the College of Arts and Sciences and deans of engineering and vice presidents of research, we have come a vast long way in creating a, a more comprehensive, collaborative, working together Northwestern in the life sciences. I'll come back to that in a minute. I also think we have come a long way in collaborating with Chicago institutions. There I mean Argonne, to maybe somewhat lesser extent Fermi. 
we created with the um, generosity of the Searle family, the Chicago Biomedical Consortia, which brings us together with the University of Chicago and the University of Illinois in Chicago. All those are really important endeavors. They're important endeavors because the costs of big science are huge, because we need to have division of labor amongst ourselves. And in coming back to one Northwestern more narrowly defined, that is within the Northwestern community, you can't do, I think we all understand this, you can't, can no longer do large scale scientific undertakings without having the collaboration of many people from many specialties in many areas. So we talked about the nanosciences. Today we're talking about people in the life sciences, the medical school, biomedical engineering, other engineering fields outside of biomedical engineering, chemistry, obviously. And we're very strong in the nanosciences, and largely because we've had a very good cross discipline, cross school set of endeavors. We're making more appointments, and we should, I hope, continue to make more appointments joint between the medical school and engineering, between the medical school and uh, Weinberg College. And another important part of this equation is the collaboration of the hospitals. We have a completely different relationship today with Northwestern Memorial Hospital than we had, say, 10 years ago. And I think it's one which works uh, better, and uh, not just for us, but also for Northwestern Memorial Hospital and healthcare across every area you want to think about. Uh, clinical services, research, which is, I mean, in the end of the day, we do research in the life sciences because we want to have better, happier, healthier people who live longer. I mean, that's what this is about. Yes, research can be beautiful. I appreciate its abstract qualities in many fields. But to my mind, you do research in, in human endeavors in order to improve the human condition. That's what it's about. That's what the aim of this is all about. And I think um, creating a, a ever more intensive uh, culture of collaboration, of which we're well along the way, figuring out how we can better hire and retain people, figuring out how they're going to be and where they're going to spend their time is all to the good. But what I want to stress is I think we've already come an extraordinary way in this process. There's more to do. I'm looking forward to having children's here on the hospital side because I think that's going to create a much closer uh, collaboration across all these areas of, as I mentioned before, research, clinical care, uh, uh, service to the community. So um, that's another important part of the component. This is never work that you reach some end state. A university is the institution par excellence where you don't reach end states that you're happy with, that you always say, is the glass half empty? Is it half fill? How can we do better? How can we do more? How can we build on what we've done? It is the nature of a university, to a great university, to be ambitious, to want to strive to do what it does better, to always ask itself what it's not doing as well as it could. I don't know of any single endeavor, except maybe our lacrosse team, uh, where I would say, gee, that's about as good as you can get. Not, not in the rest of the endeavors. It's never as good as you could be. This is a question from the audience regarding the emergency response system. Employees with less than six months at NU have no time available to use when the university allows staff to leave due to a weather or other emergency, but requires them to use vacation or personal time. What might be a better report approach? I'm going to turn that over to either Pam Beamer or Tom Evans or somebody. You want to come up, Pam? And <clears throat> well, I think this is a challenging question. Um, the reality is that, yes, while um, those who are new to the university in staff positions and non-exempt positions may not have accumulated time, we consider if the university closes or that we have um, a snow or other weather related condition, whether it be in the morning or in the evening, um, that um, time is accounted for. So um, that time might be that you might not be able to get into work 
for which then there might be some accommodation with regard to your schedule, um, or that you aren't able to stay at work because of weather conditions, et cetera. We like to think that supervisors do the right thing with regard to those who have needs um, and recognize the travel considerations, uh, but the, the program is designed to recognize those who are here and have been here to accumulate that time off. Thank you, Pam. I have maybe three questions when I ask. One is uh, with the uh, cost of living going up, do you uh, foresee the annual percentage increase in the staff uh, salary going up? The average non-exempt employee receives 3% to 3.5% uh, increase yearly. Well, the question is uh, about cost of living and salary pools. You know, we try to set the salary pools to be competitive in the markets in which we are, uh, and um, for better or worse, those are, there are a bunch of different markets. There's the market in which we physically live, which is um, a Chicago market, which is a more expensive market than if you had a university in Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, I think, um, or Ithaca, New York. Uh, and there's another market, which is the comparative university market, depending on the nature of the employees we're talking about and how mobile they are physically and across jobs. So when we get, I think at the beginning of the year, I sit down with senior vice president and the provost and the budget director and uh, the uh, benefits director, director of HR, and we look at a lot of data. We look at a lot of curves and charts. I've, I, I said yesterday when Pam was at the budget meeting that I've always felt very well served by that process. I thought, I've thought that the compilation of data has been good. I want to know what I'm doing when we try to set salary scales uh, to the question you're asking. And you know, while I want people to live nicely, and I, I don't think of myself as an evil person, I, I have to tell you that I'm driven more by markets on this question than I'm driven by equity issues. And I think anybody in my job would be driven that way. So I ask, where are we away from the markets? Where do we have to get closer in the markets? Uh, because my responsibility is to run a, a great university, as I said, it, with ambition, but also in, with prudence. That's the line. I'm always sort of skittering along. So where we think we're under the market, um, and uh, we, we try to address it. Well, some years ago, we did that with IT, where we thought we were way away from the market and we had to do better. Um, we, are, we always take cost of living increases into account. We're always looking at consumer price indices um, to try to understand uh, where we are in relationship to where we might be or ought to be. That, that's the best I can do with that question. We, we never start off with a view that there's some abstract number out there that's the number we ought to hit on salary pools, but we try to think about that number in terms of our own budgets, what we can afford, what's been happening uh, to our endowment growth, and um, also what we can, uh, what makes sense in terms of the markets that we look at and we bring in professional consultants. Now, I, I also want to make one more point with regard to this question. It's not my job to figure out what every person in the university should make. That's not how you want me to spend my time. It's my job to think about what the pools should be that get devoted. And then I would like to see the individual decisions about who gets paid what made at a decentralized level where they belong. That is, who should get what in merit raises, who should get what in pool raises. It's not for me to say, that Mary or Tom or Joe or Jill should get 3.5% or 4.1%. The only people that I do that for are the vice presidents of the university. And just so you know how the process, process works, I set the, the salary, salary scales for the vice presidents of the university. I consult with a provost, but uh, basically I initiate that process. He initiates the process for the deans of the universities, and he consults with me about those. And I do it for some other folks like the AD. And that's, that's where I get into this, the individual salary uh, setting. 
I, beyond that, it's pools that I worry about. I have another question from the audience. What specific obstacles previously prevented significant financial aid to low-income students? Is the push to change this an indication of a particular value of these students, or is it more to increase Northwestern standing? Well, f first, again, there's a, there's a mis <coughs> misconception in the premise. Northwestern, in all the years that I've been here, and going back to before my arrival here, provided financial aid on a need basis. The policy that I inherited when I came here was, I think, a very good policy. It was a policy of need-based aid. So that the policy was that every student that gets admitted to Northwestern should be able to attend Northwestern irrespective of family income. So it's not that all of a sudden we decided uh, you know, three weeks ago to provide financial aid that we weren't providing. We've been providing $75 million a year to undergraduate financial aid. I'm not talking about graduate students here. Just undergraduates have been getting $75 million in financial aid. Now, the aid that we were given, giving out, has been heretofore a combination of grants, loans, and work study. The 75 million that I'm talking about has been a grant component. Now, what we decided to do most recently was to take away the loan component for students whose families were of lower income. Now, I want to say something about that. The plan that we put in place, I think, is a vastly better plan though lots of people won't pick up on it, than a lot of things which have been announced, if they've been announced properly. So what you hear in the press is that University X or University Y decided to get rid of a loan component for students whose families had an income of under, six, say, 60,000 or 70,000 or 50,000 or 40,000 annual income. The fact is that financial aid in our financial aid office is never constructed solely on the basis of income from a tax form, from a 1040 form. Financial aid on federal forms is always a construct of income, assets, debt, number of kids of a certain age in college at the same time. In other words, it's a more complex and a better, fuller understanding of financial need than some, just income. There's another bad thing about just having an income cutoff. It's a, when you have an income cutoff, say 50,000 or 80,000 or whatever it is, it's a system that begs to be gamed by people who will say, I'll keep my income under 55,000 if you're going to give me financial aid if I'm 55,000. If I'm 56, you're not going to have any loans. It's stupid to have a system like that. You want a much more progressive system in the same way that you, I think, you, you want progressivity in the way you do taxes and a lot of other things in the world, not sort of just big banded cutoffs. So that's one of the reasons that we entered into the part of this financial aid project of capping loans at a certain uh, uh, amount. So depending on as income went up, the loan cap would have a kind of ratio to income. It's a more, so we did it, I think, in a smarter way, in a fuller way, and we've actually been complimented for doing it. I don't think the press picked up on it very much. Mr. Cubbage told me they wouldn't. I don't think I even needed him to tell me they wouldn't. I didn't expect that they would applaud this as a somewhat more intelligent way of doing it, because all they look at is that 55,000 or 60,000 number. Now, it has nothing to do with valuing students more now than we did before. We've always valued students. We value students. We value human beings. We're trying to figure out what makes sense to do for financial aid, both for Northwestern and for the students who come here, what it is that's affordable for us as well. Lyrica made an expanded program affordable. Now, I let you in on a little secret in answer to this question. I think everybody should have a loan component in financial aid. I just believe that. I believe that even for low-income uh, uh, families, having a loan component is not a terrible thing. The question is how big a loan component. We abandoned it 
for uh, the lowest income students for a couple of reasons. One, we didn't want to lose very good low income students on the basis of saying, we're going to insist you have some loans while somebody else insists you're not. Again, it was a market question. Not, I, my own public policy view, I don't privilege in this situation. I privilege the fact that we were losing good students we didn't want to lose. So the fact that I might have some moral or public policy view that everybody should pay some loans coming from goodness knows what turned out not to be a very interesting uh, uh, factor in the equation of the policy we set. So we did go for no loan. Uh, it was a, it's a competitive world, and we thought we, we needed to do that. Um, and there's something good about it. I, I, I never would want to build up a big loan burden, as I said earlier. It wasn't that I wanted people to come out of here with a, a crushing loan burden. I surely didn't. And in any case, we didn't do it. We said we'll have a no loan component uh, for people who meet certain criteria of financial aid. That's the policy that we went. We had some expanded resources. We had the time we could do it. It's a competitive market. We thought we would do it. And we'll look at it again. And maybe we have to do, do it a little bit differently two or three years from now. That's possible. Uh, that some, you know, somebody will look at this and say, well, where are we? Um, what's been happening in financial aid is that the old need-based financial aid is getting chipped away for competitive reasons on both sides of the equation. It's getting chipped away on merit aid, which I am also not, as a public policy matter, matter in really in favor of. We always have done it for athletics. We've said we'll give athletic scholarships. The notion that you could compete in the Big Ten, which is tough to do with our academic standards, which we've done anyway quite well, and not have athletic scholarships, forget it. It's, it's not. You couldn't possibly do it. So we've had, for a very long time, athletic scholarships. We've done it in a few other places in the university. We've done it um, in music with the Eckstein Fellows, and we've expanded that a little bit. So we've said, OK, um, you, you, know, you play the trombone or the flute very well. And may, may, maybe you, you're not a wide receiver, but uh, you know, we, we, we need a good uh, flutist or clarinetist. OK, should we do it for very good math students or very uh, uh, you know, wonderful writers or dancers? You can make an argument for it. Now you've gone on a slippery slope, and you're giving merit aid all over the place. We did it also for, we were one of the few universities, if not the only one, that was giving no stipends to merit, national merit scholars. So we decided we would give some stipends to national merit scholars. Now, this year, Northwestern is th number three in the country with the absolute number of merit scholars at Northwestern. And the two places ahead of us are Harvard and Texas. And one of those places, Texas, is just a hell of a lot bigger and has many more students than we have. So that's pretty remarkable. So it paid off. But it is a slippery slope, because if you start giving merit scholarships all over the place, you're in, unless you're very, very rich as a university, you're in, in um, you're in uh, peril of using up some of the budget that you want to use for needy students. I think it's more important, if I have to choose, to maintain our money, financial aid money, for needy students. But we, too, have chipped away at it a little, but not as much as a lot of places, which have really gone on for a very large uh, merit aid program. I have a different view about this world at the graduate level, so I've only been talking about undergraduates. But these are very complex, interesting questions which go very much to the heart of what we're about um, and how we should think about things, which is why I've given a long discursive answer to them. I have a uh, second question. Uh, what is being done to improve communication uh, to staff and to improve employee morale? What was the first part of it? Employee morale, I heard. What is being done to improve communications to staff and to improve employee morale? Yeah. Well, I, th I hope we work on both those things all the time. I I'm always struck at the university. How much that goes wrong at a university goes wrong because of poor communications, whether it's between faculty and administration, or staff and administration, or students and administration, or units to units. So I'm a great believer in good communication. Now, having said that, I violate my own belief system sometimes by not having the time uh, to communicate well. 
uh, Vice President Pearson just asked me to do some whole set of things on communicating something, and I said, no, I don't have the time to do it. I'm not going to do it. I probably should do it. I, you know, I know it's a good idea to do it. But I didn't say I would do it. I said, I know I should do it. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still not going to do it because I barely can get, you know, I, I'm not complaining about my job. I have one of the... <laughs> Great jobs in the world. I've loved my job. I, I always say I haven't loved every day in my job, but I've loved my job for 13 plus years. But there's just so much time in the day, and I stay in my office. It's very late at night. I don't get there at the crack of dawn, but I, you know, uh, I stay late in the evenings, and I try to clear my desk. I'm very compulsive about that. And there are just things I don't find the time to do, particularly during budget season. So what do you want me to do? You know, what do I want myself to do? That's the question, you know, you ought to ask of the president, and the president has to ask of himself or herself, and vice presidents have to ask that question, and provosts have to ask that question, blah, blah, blah. We all have to ask that question. How do we spend our time in a, an institution which can chew up your time? So um, communication is important, but we often fall down on it. It is really important to communicate to people what's going on. But, you know, if I flood the airwaves with emails, then I get complaints from students and faculty. Why, why are you sending me your 108th email on this trivial thing or that? So we try, to, we try, at least from my perspective, to ration how much general emails go out from the president's office. In terms of communication, by the way, the way life has unfolded and evolved, I probably spend two hours a day answering emails. Some of them are silly but I try to answer them, and some of them are quite consequential. It's how you spend that. You all do that. You all know how much time you're spending sitting at that machine. Um, with regard to morale, you know, my own view is the best thing that we can do for staff is to increase the salaries they get. Uh, there's enough of an economist in me left, not much, to want to think people do better if you give them money rather than give them a lot of targeted benefits. But sometimes you have to also give them a lot of targeted benefits. So in terms of morale, I think the university is a nice place to work. It's not a cutthroat place as compared to other institutions. I'm on the board of some of those institutions. I can tell you working for a university these days is a better place to be than working for an investment bank where you might have a lot of peril about where your next paycheck is gonna, gonna be, if it's gonna be. Um, so that we try to create decent conditions of work and we try to create a situation, I think a university is a relatively, not a hierarchical institution. It's pretty flat, it's collegial. You try to deal with people in a nice way. I've never felt in my job um, the way to get a lot of things done was just to give orders as if it was General Beenan instead of President Beenan. But rather, you try to persuade people and get their buy-in as to what you're trying to do and explain it within the limits of the time you have to explain to think, people. At the end of the day, people are free to leave. Um, and they can go somewhere else if they don't find this an attractive place to work. We want people to find it an attractive place to work. We want to feel that they're not just here for a salary, but because we have a special mission in the world. And that mission, and many missions, but it can be encompassed with, uh, under the statement, we try to do well in the world. We're trying to do good things in the world. We're trying to create beautiful things, uh, whether it's in performance uh, or even through the research that we do. We're trying to teach people. Uh, we're trying to help, uh, help the world be a better place. That's, that's our mission. It's not a for-profit organization. We need money to run it, but we're not turning out widgets. We're turning out people, and we're turning out research uh, and knowledge to make the world a beautiful and better place. So, of, of course, you hope people will buy into that. And I think many of the people who work here, no matter what their job is, do buy into it. They do think that there's, that there's a greater good here that's being served. I'd like to think that in any case, but I prefer to believe it, so don't tell me differently. I have one last question. Kind of a sidebar and what we were talking about, about salary and morale. Um, if you have a performance review, review 
Is your salary based upon that? Well, I certainly hope so. I hope that there's, if, if there's not a very tight relationship between review and salary, we're wasting our time doing review. Um, I believe so. But if you, work, if you have a job and you're working all that year, is your review should be based primarily on that year, what you're performing, or what you might put in a review during the course of it? In other words, like, if you do a review, you might want to put down uh, a class. Okay, if you don't find a class, will that dictate that what you've done the whole year is negated? I mean, if you do work well the Well, whole I'm gonna, I, again, have to ask the HR people to speak to that question. The performance review process is designed to establish some objectives and some goals for the year for which then there is ongoing discussion throughout the year that will culminate in a performance evaluation at the conclusion of the year. And that process then results in a discussion with regard to what merit um, or salary adjustment might have been earned for that year. Um, every year that process continues and your assessment for that year's performance is based on that year. So your salary adjustment would be considered for that year. Um, so if you have a, a stellar year where you meet all of your objectives and, um, and go above and beyond, then I would expect that that would be reflective in the adjustment that you might receive. Um, if there are components of your performance assessment process that were not met, then that certainly, I would anticipate, have some influence on what the pay increase opportunity might be for you. So the performance of that year is going to be important in telling with regard to the opportunity. Is that performance job related? The, your, your work, it would be your work performance with regard to you know, your, what you've accomplished for the year. For that personal the job that you're doing? or the job that's been defined that you, uh, that you hold here at Northwestern. So, so when you took a cooking class, you know, to, uh, you put on your performance, and you, and you, you achieved a cooking class, that means that you uh, uh, achieved your objectives? Well, I'm not sure what uh, the job might be and whether a cooking class would be considered with regard to your performance. So I think it depends on what your position is, whether the class you take is related to your job. And that would be something important to discuss with your supervisor about whether what coursework you might be taking would apply um, and be considered with regard to your work performance evaluation. I think maybe we have time for one last one. Yeah, so one last question. Is there anyone else that would like to ask? I have a question, but I want to give anyone else a chance that would like. OK, so let me ask this one. So this is a question that was submitted to NUSEC previously. Are there plans in place to remedy the inequity between faculty and staff retirement plans, particularly in regard to tying staff contribution plans to a staff member's age? This is another question I think comes up yearly. I'll, I'm going to turn it back to Pam again. You should just stay up here, Pam. You should have given you us. <clears throat> My answer might not be fully adequate, having been here a matter of um, about five and a half months. Um, but I am aware that this is an issue that I think has been asked a number of times over the years. Um, it is something that has certainly become part of my radar screen as I've talked to folks um, that, who have raised the question of why is there a difference. Um, there are a variety of reasons, I think, for that difference. One uh, significant difference, um, I think, has to do with just the finances and the, the overall total compensation package that we offer to staff. And there are ways of supporting individual uh, you know, groups of staff members uh, in terms of what the labor market looks like um, and how that um, support for individual staff members um, fits with the market and what other uh, competitive institutions are doing. So uh, up until this time, certainly the funding support 
for staff members have been uh, divided up in ways that result in a total package of salaries and benefits and retirement contributions that are market competitive uh, on the whole. Now, whether there is interest in looking at other ways to accomplish that, other ways to provide that funding support, I would certainly be open to looking at that and providing data that might support um, some review. But I'm you know, certainly not in a position to make any commitments at this point, certainly for the institution, because I think there's some additional um, review that might be needed. To the second part of that question that has to do with age, um, I am not certain even that that might be legal to do that um, based on age. So I would want to check to see whether that was even appropriate. Um, we do it based on length of service, which I think just um, you know, as a matter of fairness, seems appropriate with regard to the, the level of contribution and length of time that people have committed um, their, you know, their uh, expertise to the university. Uh, so that would be a question I would have to check into. Yeah, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the way the current retirement plan works, as you reach certain ages, your, um, the amount that the university kicks in, the percent goes up. So I believe when you reach age 40, the university starts contributing a higher percent. Um, and then I can't, I'm not sure what the next 50, what the next milestone is. But almost all, everything that has to do with that kind of benefit structure, you, you're operating within federal law and federal mandates. I mean, so you're, you can't create a structure, as, as Pam alluded to, which would run against federal strictures. That's just not possible. And one of the, one of the things you know I would say and that's well I won't say it but I was going to say something about overregulation of things but not having to do with this subject. But one of the things which is really striking in the university in my job is how much time you spend responding now to an ever more regulated environment, and I don't just mean in the research environment, but everywhere you look, um, you have unfunded mandates to do this and regulations which require ever more paperwork and ever more uh, time commitments. Um, some of them are good, you know, in, in the Senator Grassley and Baucus's request for information about university endowments, I actually applaud the request. It's, it's a pain in the neck to get all the data together, but it, it's good. I think it'll demystify a lot of what goes on with regard to how universities set endowment spending and, and what they do. So I actually think it's a good idea to have that request made and that we should respond fully, which we would have to do anyway. It doesn't matter what I think. But you, you really are operating a complex institution today in a very different environment than in the past. And it always seems to me there's never a regulation taken away. It's always layered on. It's, so, you know, we have costs today. We have legal costs that nothing we can do about. They're there. We, uh, we, have, to, we have to do these things. All kinds of people wonder why tuition is high. The same people who, who uh, complain about tuition and endowments create ever more expenses for a university with, letter, with federal legislation. And they never st seem to stop and say, hey, what did we just do? Did it just cost these folks a couple of million bucks a year to comply with this regulation? That's life. Well, I want to thank President Beenan for coming today. I want to thank everyone um, who attended. Um, I especially want to thank everyone who submitted questions. And we received many questions both through email from the Evanston campus and from the audience here. And we obviously didn't have time to get to all of them. So I wanted to let you know that any questions we did not get to today, we are planning on um, submitting to the president so he can at least, he definitely will at least see everyone's questions, the ones that weren't asked today. So again, I want to thank you and um, on behalf of the President's Office and on behalf of NUSAC.